Everybody can see that and everybody can hear me. Awesome. Um, guys, it's so awesome to, to actually be here tonight. Uh, Andrew and I came up from New York City uh, this morning at like six in the morning and uh, we're, we're pretty excited to be back in, in Boston. Um, Andrew mentioned that we went to school here and uh, yeah, we spent a good a good five years of our life, our, our lives in the city. So we're, we're very excited. And it's also really exciting to see like how active the Jamstack community here is in Boston. Um, we've been following the, uh, what Jam has been doing for a while um, with, uh, with the event and we're, we're super excited about it. In, in New York, I feel like we don't even get this big of a turnout at our, our local Jamstack event in New York all the time. So like, this is really exciting. Um, so keep up the awesome work, keep spreading. And I'm going to be talking about the thing that Andrew and I actually work on and, and build every day, which is called uh, Take, Take Shape. Um, we're pretty, as you can tell, we're pretty steeped in GraphQL on multiple fronts, really. So we use GraphQL to build the Take Shape product, um, and our users are primarily interacting with Take Shape, you know, through GraphQL in terms of uh, the APIs that they use. So I'm going to give you a quick introduction to Take Shape, explain why we picked GraphQL as our core technology for our stack and for our users. And then I'm going to tie GraphQL and headless content management systems together and show you how to build something using both of these things. Um, so uh, what is TakeShape? Well, it's a headless GraphQL CMS. Um, is any, everybody sort of like familiar with the idea of headless CMS? OK, cool. So I'm going to just break it down for you. So headless, meaning uh, decoupled from presentation. So the authoring environment, which is uh, you know, what people interact with when they interact with TakeShape uh, as a web client, is totally separate and disconnected from the website that your users interact with. And this is really one of like, the core tenets of the Jamstack, right? You know, your artifacts are pre-rendered, and they're usually pre-rendered HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. So what does that give you? Well, that gives you more performance more security, <laughs> more scalability, and uh, more fun for you as the developer. It's a lot, it's, uh, may, I'm gonna posit that it might be more fun to build the Jamstack website uh, than it is maybe to build like uh, just a traditional WordPress website or like a Drupal website or something like that. So GraphQL, so GraphQL is at the core of TakeShape. Every time you're interacting with content on TakeShape, you're interacting with the GraphQL API, whether that's if you're touching the API directly or you're actually working with the web client, everything is built around a core GraphQL API. Um, and a CMS, well, you might be working with people that feel more comfortable interacting with something visual. And so we provide an interface for, you know, like a non-technical, non-developer user who wants to manage their content that way. Um, the other part, a really big part of TakeShape is that we built a static site generator. So we think of it more as a static content generator in that it's a step lower of an abstraction from something like a Gatsby. Uh, you can use it to generate a static website, but we wanted to keep our static content generator really simple. And we basically just focus on GraphQL queries and templates and how we can use that to produce files. Uh, so those files might be HTML, they might be JSON, um, they could be uh, you know, just regular old XML or anything like that. Uh, we, and the other part of our static content generator is that we really let you bring your own build system. So if you want, if you want to handle JavaScript and CSS in whatever way you want to ha handle it, we allow you to bring your own build system to, to the tool to, to make it easier in that way. So this combination of headless, GraphQL, and static sites is, makes for like a pretty sweet CMS for the Jamstack. Jam is sweet, and it's, you know, this is my only joke. <laughs> um, so what does TakeShape really look like? Well, it's uh, modeling, it's creating content, and it's uh, developing with that content, and then, and then using that content uh, out on the web. Uh, we're really glad that we ended up deciding to build on top of GraphQL. Uh, when we first started planning TakeShape two and a half, or actually no, three, you know, three and a half years ago, we really were agonizing over this decision. We weren't sure if we should start with like a REST endpoint or this GraphQL endpoint or like a Falcor endpoint, if anybody sort of like remembers Falcor. <laughs> and at the time we felt certain that we were going to need like every endpoint and uh, we thought, 
we have to support every potential use case and we're gonna just need to build everything. And luckily, I think we ended up being wrong about that. Um, you know, we ended up, I think, picking, running with a technology that, um, yeah, we ended up sort of like being wrong about that. Um, let me just kind of go over some pros and cons of, um, you know, of why we decided to use GraphQL. Andrew talked a little bit about um, some of the reasons why GraphQL is really good for the Jamstack. Um, some of the, the cons, why we were maybe hesitant to use it. You know, GraphQL at the time was relatively new and not really widely adopted. You know, the first stable release for GraphQL was in like 2016 in October. And we started, you know, planning and, and thinking about TakeShape uh, in August of that year or July of that year. So, um, so it wasn't really like clear if this technology was going to win and how far it was going to go. There was also some like licensing concerns around the technology. So Facebook is the originator of GraphQL um, and React. And uh, the licensing terms that they had on GraphQL originally were really like sort of restrictive. Um, so luckily, Facebook fixed that and they, they re-released uh, GraphQL and React. Um, and so they, they fixed that for everyone. And that's a, a, you know, a pretty awesome thing for the developer community. And REST was really like so familiar to people. Like, could we really convince people at the time to like make this transition to, to using a GraphQL endpoint? Um, but there were some really important pros. So, you know, we were having like flashbacks to wrestling with REST endpoints to try to mash up custom data. Um, and that was one of the original reasons why Facebook had designed and, and built GraphQL was really to overcome the sort of the pain of trying to combine um, multiple, uh, you know, multiple data sources from multiple different um, uh, REST endpoints. Um, then, uh, you know, we were thinking about like, well, messing around with curl and trying to figure out how, to, how an API really works, that's really painful. Like, you know, uh, if you've ever used a, like an API-based CMS that doesn't use GraphQL, um, you know, you're not, never really sure what kind of fields you're gonna get back with your templates. Um, you know, there's some, there's some REST APIs for WordPress and you're never like quite sure what it is you're actually gonna get back when you, when you touch that uh, endpoint. But as Andrew was showing us earlier, you know, the uh, GraphQL is so declarative that you, you know exactly what you're, what you're requesting and you know exactly what you're gonna be getting back. I think that's like the coffee machine. It's like so, it's, it's musical. <laughs> um, so in the end, it, it basically came down to a few things. Like, like everybody here, you know, we really liked working with new technologies a lot more than we liked working with like older, cruftier technologies. And so we decided that we would take that leap, leap uh, of faith for ourselves. Um, and really GraphQL also drastically reduced the amount of code that we needed to write to actually get our API working. So like maybe every good developer, there was a little bit of us that was sort of lazy um, and we just wanted to be able to get started and, and get something um, out there faster. Um, and then the idea of like the, the, you saw a little bit of the self-documenting features of, the, of GraphQL in the graphical explorer that Andrew showed. And that is a really powerful um, uh, function of, of GraphQL itself. And it really drastically simplifies learning how to use an API for new developers. Um, since we're building, since TakeShape is really a tool uh, where everyone's API is essentially different and up to them and due to their circumstances and their own creativity, it's really important that learning their own API and learning how to interact with the platform is easy. And that self-documentation of, of GraphQL just makes that, makes that like a no-brainer. Um, and really, most importantly, we were our own guinea pigs in this. Uh, I'm a front-end developer and, and I found GraphQL queries to be really easy for, for, for myself and people like me to use. Um, at the time, I was running an agency in Brooklyn, and we were already building static sites and, and using some of the Jamstack approach. Um, so we knew we really wanted to build a CMS that helped people who had similar problems to the ones that we ourselves were trying to overcome um, and saw the world kind of like we did. And I, I think it's uh, the fact that this kind of event now exists um, is really exciting because it means that the world, uh, the world is moving in that direction, which is, which is great. So fast forward to today, and I think we chose wisely when we went with GraphQL. Um, and if you're working with content and you're making it available via a GraphQL API, and if you're not making it available via a GraphQL API, I think that you're probably at a disadvantage. Uh, I mean, like, it's nice to look at, 
it's easy to understand what you're what you're what you're working with and how to use it. And you saw how simple that was with with, with Andrew's demo. Um, you know, so how do we use GraphQL with TakeShape, and what are the components that are involved? Um, well, GraphQ TakeShape is really built around a GraphQL API. It's not just how our developers interface with TakeShape. You know, we use it to actually build our entire application. Um, so it's not just like a bolt-on API onto an existing CMS system. Um, so we use that same GraphQL API that we make available to every developer that they use to build their websites to actually power the, the single page React application that is the TakeShape web client. Um, we also use it to power the CLI tools and the, the static content generator that we've built. Um, so it's really how the entire application runs. So we're using a GraphQL API to build a GraphQML CMS that provides a GraphQL API. It's like very, very meta. <clears throat> so developers interact with TakeShape's GraphQL API basically in three ways. They make requests directly through our GraphQL endpoint. They use TakeShape's static content generator and they write GraphQL files that retrieve content stored from TakeShape and use that to generate static websites. Um, and then they might use other static site generators like Gatsby that like to play well with, with GraphQL. So now I'm gonna show you a demo uh, of how to build uh, what we're gonna call the Jamstack job board on, on TakeShape. And we're gonna write some GraphQL queries and it's gonna be pretty neat. All right, let's see if we can transition this thing to a different. Should switch. Let's do a view of server. All right. All right. Let's see if we can make those things go. Okay. So um, we are going to build the the Jamstack job board. This is what we're going to build. This was inspired by one of our own uh, Jamstack job board. Was actually inspired by one of our own customers. Uh, a guy named Ramon. So Ramon uh, messaged us in our, in our intercom live chat one day, and he was like, hey, I'm, uh, I'm into marketing. I, uh, I don't know a ton about development, but I have some basic front-end development skills, and I really want to build, um, really build a website using TakeShape. Um, I'm going to give it a try. And then a week later, after asking a couple follow-up questions, he came back and he was like, hey, I just want you to know, I just launched a growth jobs list on Product Hunt and we're number two today. So thanks so much for making it really easy to make a website. And we were like, that's awesome. Like, great job. Uh, that's really cool. So he, so Ramon created growth job list, um, which is maybe not for anybody here, but it's for growth marketers. He did it in a week and he was, he was, uh, it was very exciting to see him kind of put this thing together. Um, so he inspired us to actually build uh, a, a whole new template for Jamstack, which is called the Shape Job Board. Um, so we're going to be building the Shape Job Board today, and I'm going to walk you through how that works. Uh, so the, the, the basics of a, of a job board are there are jobs, uh, and, <laughs> and there, are, uh, there are jobs, and there's a homepage. So the, the essence of the, sh the, the Shape Job Board is, is pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Uh, I'm going to show you how to model that out and, and what you're actually going to do. So when I log into TakeShape and I actually start a project, we're going to start just a, a new blank project. We're going to call it like uh, Jamstack Boston Jobs. We're going to get started. Come on, Internet. There you go. All right, great. So when it, whenever you start a, a project with TakeShape, um, you're presented with sort of these setup steps. And there's three basic things that you're gonna do with TakeShape. You're gonna model content, you're gonna actually create content that goes into those models, and then you're gonna use that content either directly through the API, or you're gonna use it through GraphQL files that are written in a part of the static content generator. So we're gonna, do, we're gonna go the route of using the static content generator today to build the Shape Jobs website. 
So if I take a peek at my shape job site, uh, I need to start actually modeling out what I see here. Uh, so you can imagine that maybe you're uh, on a development team and you're working with a designer and the designer has uh, provided you some initial wireframes or they're providing you designs and it's like, well, where do I actually begin and how do I, how do I start to flesh this stuff out? So if we look at the site, we see that we've got jobs. We see that we've, uh, job has, let's see, it's got a, an, a title. Uh, and we see that jobs have companies associated with them and they have like a job description. It's, it's pretty straightforward. So we're gonna start actually uh, building out that model in take shape. So I'm gonna add new, start adding new content types and we're gonna start with like the idea of a company. Uh, companies are gonna be taxonomies and we'll talk about that in a minute. But like what makes up a company? Well, you know, like companies have a name uh, and in our world, they, you know, they probably just have like a logo, at least right now. Um, we probably want these things to be required. And now we have our first content type. So we could start filling in content now if we wanted, but let's continue to flesh out the, the website. So we could add the idea of a job. We're gonna have a bunch of these and a job, as we saw in the site, a job's got a title. Um, I think a job has probably some other things like it has this idea of a hot job and it's got an associated company. So we're gonna say that a job has a title. It's also got like a, like a body, like a description. Uh, it's got that idea of whether or not it's like a hot job or not. Uh, and it's got the, it's got a company. So we wanna be able to rel relate these things to each other. And you probably only have one company that a job is for and, uh, and we set it to be related to that company. So now we have companies and we have jobs. So we could actually start like fleshing this out if we wanted to. So we could, we could start making, you know, we could start making new jobs here. So like, let's make like a front end engineer and we can like start making companies. Let's say like Localytics. Did I spell that right? Uh, and now we want to add like have like logos. So we're going to need some assets in, into this job. So we can handle that. So assets inside of Take Shape are just another content type. They're just like every other content type and they just happen to be provided by the, the system itself. So we can actually start uploading our, our asset content and kind of getting that in there. So, uh, well, we don't have a good local, let's use this like, like nice rocket for Localytics. And then we can start creating companies and then you know we might wanna like have a little description about this job. And now we've got a title, a, a company, and a body. So let's just save it. So the other thing that I was doing as I was modeling, like the, the very act of modeling all this content out is building that schema. It's building these forms and it's making all of this accessible to, via the API right away. So if I actually wanted to explore this through, the, through GraphQL, I could do that without very much effort. <clears throat> and the way that I can do that is by using the built-in graphical explorer. So Andrew showed you the graphical explorer when it's just hooked up to like a, a, a React application, but we decided to build the graphical explorer directly into Take Shape to make it really easy to play around with the API and explore your data and kind of get a, a lay of the land. And so this is the query that's gonna retrieve our content about, um, let's make it a little easier to read, content about that particular job. So this is, this is actually getting the, the live content uh, back right here and, and we can not only can we get that one job but we could actually get like the whole list of jobs if we wanted to um, and we could bring that back so if we had more than one job we could we could get a whole bunch of them so what are the other parts of our our job our shape job board website well we've got this we've modeled out companies we've modeled out jobs we also have this idea of like a home page which has some some features on it um, so let's actually like model out what like a homepage would be like. So we have a homepage, there's only one of them. Um, and it looks like they, it, we have this idea of like this hero area. Uh, so we're actually going to like start making, modeling out a hero. Uh, that hero had like a heading. It also had 
like a little background image. And the other thing that we had over there was like these featured jobs. So we want to, we want a way of like featuring jobs on this home page. And we probably want to have multiple jobs on the home page. And so we just relate jobs into them. So like maybe we start fleshing out some content, content here. We can pick something for our background image, this like little jam jar. And we've got like only one job right now, so we'll make that one featured. The other part of our, our website is sort of like the, the general stuff. So we've got you know, this heading and, and a logo, and that's gonna be shared across every page. So maybe we have the idea of like site settings. Again, there's only one of these. We had that site title. And we also had like a site logo, right? So you can start to see how like the model, like because the modeling is so flexible with, uh, you know, just the idea that you can have any field wherever you really need it. You can, you can model anything from this, this site settings, you could be modeling like open graph data that's gonna be shared across uh, pages as fallbacks. So you, can, you can really start to, to, to um, get very flexible with that. Um, so we've just got our like Jamstack, uh, Boston jobs. And maybe we've got like another jam jar that we wanna use here. All right, so we've like modeled our, pro we've modeled our website out. We have, uh, you know, we, we saw how we can use the API to retrieve content out of this. Now, like, what do we actually, what do we actually do with it? Like, how do we, how do we use this um, and, and develop off with, with, against it? So we're gonna flip over to our, our like local dev environment. Um, so what we're looking at here is this, uh, this project fleshed out as, uh, as all of the templates. Uh, the most important part of a, of a take, shape, um, take shape project that you're gonna build is this TSG YAML file. And this is really configuring, uh, configuring what's gonna happen with your, with your site. So we have some basic like uh, 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 variables up here that identify like where our templates are gonna live, where our static assets are gonna live in this project, where we're gonna be building to, uh, and then the meat and potatoes is really down in the routes. So, uh, with TakeShape, we have this idea, if you're familiar with something like Express, we kind of take the idea of routes and we sort of flip it on its head. So routes are where web pages are actually gonna generate out and where they're gonna be created. So if we look at the idea of our homepage, we're gonna be generating out to the root path. And the way that we're gonna be generating out is we're gonna take a, a template file called homepage HTML, and we're gonna take a GraphQL file called homepage GraphQL, and we're gonna basically mush those things together. So the take shape static site generator essentially runs this, uh, this GraphQL file, the GraphQL query on your behalf. And then it inserts the result from that query into the context of the HTML. So if we look at our, the idea of jobs and we look at jo our jobs GraphQL file, it's gonna look an awful lot similar to what we just saw with uh, in the the take, in the GraphQL in the uh, API Explorer that we saw, so we have the idea of getting a job list. We have uh, it's going to return all of those jobs, and it's going to return this this specific data about those jobs. And Andrew is mentioning that there is some really good tooling involved with with GraphQL, and this is where that comes into play. So, um, so what we get basically for free with our IDE is we get uh, a connection up directly up to, to take shape and the actual schema. Uh, so our IDE is aware of the GraphQL schema inside of take shape, and then we get some benefits from that. So we get code completion in our query files. So if we wanted to like, if we wanted to, um, you know, get code completion in our query file, we could, and then we can also run all of these queries locally in our own IDE, which is pretty nice. It's, it's pretty ha a pretty handy feature to, to, to have. All right, so now that we've seen the, the, the query file, uh, we can take a peek over at the template. Um, so the template 
is going to have a bunch of things that look very familiar. Uh, so if you have worked with handlebars or anything like that in the past, this is very similar. It's, it's Mozilla's Nunjux templating language. Um, it's, uh, it's a flavor of like the Jinja 2 templating language if you've like ever used Django or anything like that. It's the, it's the JavaScript version of that. Um, and you can see the, the variables that are coming down from the GraphQL query file and just how we can really easily access them inside the template. So if we want to actually run all of this locally, here's what we can, here's what we can do. So we're going to initialize a connection up to take shape and authenticate with the service so that our local IDE, our local development environment can actually communicate back and forth to the API. So we're just going to initialize and run and uh, authenticate to take shape. So what I, get, what I get to do here is I get a listing of all my take shape projects. Uh, and I'm just going to pick the project that's related to what it is that we're looking at working on right now, which is the Jamstack Boston Jobs. This is just a little notification to tell you about uh, what files you shouldn't you shouldn't add to your uh, you should be adding to your gitignore and you shouldn't be committing into your version control. Um, and then I can just simply start this up. And this is going to run the take shape build process, which take, TSG is the command line tool here. Uh, and all that's doing on my behalf is running all of the queries that I have. Uh, it's looking at my TSG YAML file, looking at the queries that I have referenced there, and then it's running those against t the take shape endpoint. Um, so we end up with uh, we end up with the site being fed directly off uh, take shape the take shape API. Uh, so now what I can do is I can um, I can start to make changes to this content. Um, so if I maybe like wanted to change around my content a little bit. I could actually make some changes. Uh, and then because there's, a two, there's some two-way communication between the take shape uh, API and our CLI, we actually can push that content back into the, uh, into the CLI tool and have it rerun our queries for us. Uh, so we can get fresh content if we want to be working off of fresh content. Or we could disable that and, and not have it do that. Um, we could uh, we could do all of our development processes. We can make changes to our templates. We can make changes to our queries. And we can start to build all of this out. Um, now, how do I actually like deploy it? And how do I use it out into the world? Uh, well, I can hook this up to uh, a service like Netlify, uh, Amazon S3, Google Cloud Storage, or like any old FTP anywhere. And I can actually de deploy to any of those environments, just you know, either directly from my my local machine or through like a CLI service. So I'm going to just show you how to like hook up Netlify into this and actually be using Netlify. And then we're just going to have a, a live site that's, that's deployed. So I'm actually going to switch from this project over to a project that has a bunch more content in it just for, for kind of, actually, we'll, we'll stick with this project. So we're going to hook this up to a Netlify account. We just authorize, we sort of have this like OAuth flow that happens with Netlify. <laughs> So now we're able to connect any of our existing Netlify sites to the to take shape, or we can create new ones. So we're gonna add a add the idea of a static site. Let's call it just like Netlify. Netlify is our provider. We're gonna we're gonna make a new Netlify site. We're just gonna let it create its own name, uh, and now we've got this uh, this Netlify site that is being built over on Netlify. So take shape decide, take, what TakeShape does is it actually puts a little placeholder out in Netlify for you, in Netlify land for you. So we'll just see like, uh, we'll just look at what that, what that placeholder looks like real quick. So we end up with this nice little, like this little placeholder thing. And then I'm gonna grab, I'm actually gonna grab the URL so that I can show you another another aspect of TakeShape that's kind of cool, which is something we call live links. Um, so I'm gonna flip back over to my, my static site and I'm gonna drop that base URL in here and you're gonna see in just a second like what that does. So I'm gonna flip back to my, my local environment and I'm just gonna reconnect to TakeShape, but this time I'm gonna connect with the idea of that static site in mind. So 
so now, now my Netlify site is in there. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually deploy all of this up. So this is gonna actually send the, it's gonna bundle up my templates uh, and my GraphQL files, and it's going to send them up to the TakeShape service, where from now on what's gonna happen is TakeShape is actually gonna be running, running every time you publish to your site, TakeShape is actually gonna be running the static site generator within a Lambda function on your behalf. So, so you don't have to worry about like a separate CI process or running it locally and redeploying locally. Now you have this little like very fast um, Lambda environment that's gonna execute your, 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 your static site generator. Um, so if we flip over to the site, we should actually have a site up. Awesome, that's pretty cool. So the click, the, the like one click integration with Netlify makes it like really easy to just deploy something. Um, what, did, what else did we get from that? Well, the, the interesting thing that our static site generator does is that because we're using GraphQL, we know about every query that you make and from where you're making those queries. And so from that, we can extrapolate exactly what URL any of your content is gonna live on. So this front end engineer job, this entry for a front end engineer position lives over in these live links over here. And we know that it lives at this, this, uh, this path and we know it also lives at the homepage, the root path. So this can be really interesting because you can have content that lives all over a website and uh, with, with the static site generator and GraphQL, we can tell you exactly where any of it lives, which is really neat. So we can click over here and we can immediately kind of go to this, uh, this job posting. Uh, and then we know that it's on the homepage because we know that it's being used, used uh, as one of the featured posts. So if we wanted to make changes to this and we wanted to have those changes published out, we could you know, simply, let's mark it as a hot job. And then we can republish the site. And then we end up you know, being able to see our changes over here. It's kind of neat. That's, the, that's basically the, the flow of how you go from, like, I have a design to now I have a website and it's live. And not only do I have all of that, but I have a, a, a way for somebody who's not a developer to go in and actually make edits and make content changes. Um, so this is neat in that we just saw how you use the API from the static site generator. But the API is available uh, to use directly if you wanted to. So if you say said we're creating something that you know didn't rely on on uh, wasn't a website or wasn't you didn't want to implement using the TickShape static site generator, you could you know use the the the, a, the GraphQL API directly and actually get your content out that way, which is what a bunch of people do. A bunch of people use TickShape in conjunction with GraphQL, and then they also use it in to feed maybe their um, you know, content that lives inside of uh, an application that has nothing to do with, with the web. They, people can use it to feed into like a mobile app or a backend application that is providing, you know, like help desk services or things like that. So people have found all sorts of different ways to use this, this technology and, and this way of building things. Uh, so let me switch back to the presentation if I can do that. So TakeShape has a Slack. You can join us on the, the TakeShape Slack if you wanna learn more about this. Just go to takeshape.io and there's a link on the bottom to, the, to, to join us on Slack. Uh, so there's some healthy conversation going over there in terms of like how to do different things with TakeShape and, and, uh, and, and that's sort of like, a, that's where we are all day. Uh, so you can, you can find us over there. Um, are there any questions? Um, so the first thing I was thinking was whether or not TakeShape had built-in theming. So no, no, no built-in theming, but uh, it's really easy to like build these these themes and then share them. Uh, so what we do do is we provide a series of sample projects. So let me actually like let me share that. 
So we provide, the way that we handle that is we provide a bunch of sample projects for you to choose from. So there's like, if, you're, if you wanna start building a blog or you wanna start building an e-commerce store or you wanna start building the job board or uh, you know, like a general marketing, marketing site or a portfolio. So we separate out the actual models from the, uh, from the templates. So you can, you can start uh, creating any of these and you'll get the, the full content model. And then there's a series of, um, oop, this little guy got in the way. There's a series of uh, templates available. Um, this is available from the, the, uh, the, the setup steps guide. You can just pop over to the GitHub repo and all of these have templates, starter template projects that go with them. Um, and so the, the second part I was curious about uh, more like configuration management, whether or not there was some way of ma uh, like managing like authorization or uh, for like different tasks. So do you mean like uh, having different membership roles? Yeah. So yeah, like exactly. li limiting people down? Yes. Yeah. So we provide like a very, like a few very basic roles. So there's like administrator role, an editorial role, and a, uh, like a viewer role. But the permission system that we have is like super flexible. It's, it's basically like based on, the, on IAM roles for S3. Uh, so if you needed something that was really, really specific, we can create custom roles for people. So we've done that from time to time to, to allow people to get really specific with what a member can, can edit and, and create. Cool. Yeah, thank you. Hi, um, I was wondering if uh, you had the ability to let um, content editors or creators like preview um, what they're editing before going live. Yeah, so the way that folks handle that is they typically build like a, a production static site and then they'll build a staging static site and then they use those live links on the side to actually be able to, to view where content is going. So you can publish out to that, that staging site and then view it and then publish out to the production site and view it. And then there's, there's like a more advanced workflow that, um, that folks do, which is that there are environment variables that go with the static sites. So you can actually create switches. You can model switches into the, you know, the content models and you can switch uh, you know, where that content is gonna be available, whether it should only be available into like staging or available on production. And then you can use the, env the environment variables that are related to that static site to enforce that. Um, so you, you can give people a way to actually like build out that workflow. I got a question. Mm -hmm. um, so if you were going to integrate a web application with like a third party service, something like Salesforce, for instance, would the, would the best approach be to, you know, model your, your website content and take shape and then, you know, maybe use something like Gatsby for site generation. And then as you're, you're pulling information from take shape and then you're, you're pairing it like kind of like Andrew showed earlier, like pulling from like OMDB or pulling from Salesforce or whatever it may be and then kind of combining those on generation or, or does the integration happen in the take shape interface itself? How would you approach that? that? So that's a totally valid way to do that. And that's actually a great segue to uh, the next slide that I have on here if I haven't lost the presentation. Ah, where did it go? Huh, where did that go? Oh no. disappeared. Okay. The presentation is gone. All right. Well, that's okay. That's a great way to do that. And that brings me to, to our next point, which is that, so Andrew and I have like developed a ton of learnings about the Jamstack, about GraphQL, and about, um, you know, the, the, some of the problems that face the Jamstack community. And so we're building, right now what we're doing is we're building the next generation product uh, that we have for TakeShape. <clears throat> so take shape right now is this right now what we have is this idea of take shape as a CMS product and what we're building next is this idea of take shape mesh which addresses that exact problem that you that you just pointed out there so like where does your collation of content and data happen does it happen at build time like with with something like a Gatsby or does it happen at a different point in the 
in the process. And so our, our thesis is that it happens not at build time, uh, but further back. And so if you are interested in what I just said, <laughs> which is um, uh, this idea of solving that problem, um, you know, you can sign up for a TakeShape account and you'll be one of the first people that gets on the TakeShape mesh beta. Uh, so that's gonna be launching in a few months um, and that we're gonna be launching out to the, the current TakeShape audience. Um, and it's to address the, the question of like, well, in the Jamstack, when you have all of these disparate services and they're all spread, spread around everywhere, how do you find ways of bringing them together? Um, that's a really exciting challenge for the Jamstack because uh, there's, there's a lot of obvious benefits of like why you should do static site generation, you know, why we should adopt these, these tools and techniques. Um, and, uh, and there's also a lot of opportunity in that, in that there's problems that haven't totally been solved yet. And so we're excited to solve that problem. Um, so yeah, so if you, if you are curious to see what, the, <clears throat> what Take Shape Mesh is gonna be, then sign up for an account and we'll get you onto the beta once it launches. Awesome, thank you. Let, let's give Mark a round of applause. <laughs> Definitely sign up for your Take Shape Mesh beta account. I'm gonna do it, that sounds super cool. 